tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are director Ron O.J. Parson and actress Lori O'Brien. Ron O.J. Parson is a native of Buffalo, New York graduated from the University of Michigan's theater program and has worked as a director and actor. He's worked at theaters all over Chicago, including my favorites, The Steppenwolf and The Goodman. He's worked in Canada and on the U.S. stages in Portland, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Louisville. And how did that path for you change from acting to directing? Well, it's funny. Uh, uh, I uh, was in New York, you know, pounding the pavement as an actor, and I lived out here for a couple of years as well. But uh, I felt um, when I got to Chicago, I wanted to start my own company. So there's, <laughs> there's over 200, 250 companies in Chicago. So I figured, you know, I need to do something unique. And when it happened, I ended up having to do the directing as well as the acting. Oh. So it kind of evolved from that as I got to direct more and more. Um, though it started picking up and the career picked did up. Did you act in New York? Yeah, I did. I did, I did a lot of stuff uh, way back in the... On Off-Broadway, Broadway? Off-Broadway, off mostly. I didn't get to Broadway until I was with Steppenwolf, and we did uh, What'd you do? One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, and, you, and, and it was your production? No, it was Gary Sinise was the star. Yeah. Terry Kenny directed it, and I was just a young actor. Oh, you well, were? Kind of young. I wasn't that young. But <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Younger than I am now. But you, but you founded the Onyx Theater. Is yeah, that Onyx, what you were talking I, yeah, about, Onyx the Theater, Ensemble? On, Onyx Theater Ensemble. We started that. And we were able to do some good things. We didn't have a lot of money, but we were able to do some things and make some, some, some progress with the, the, the acting community in, in Chicago. How did you start it? Did you have actors to start it? You must well, have, because you had to direct. Well, it's kind of a long <laughs> story. We, we had a group of actors that wanted to, to act, yeah. basically. And one of my best friends was the marketing director at the Goodman Theater. Uh. And so that was a good connection. And so we were able to get a lot of actors together who wanted to, you know, a small company right. to be able to do what they want. At one time, it was <laughs> hard because we were all equity members, but the small company was oh. non-equity. So we had to usually hire out and uh, eventually develop a, a contract that we could work. Did you have a theater? Where did you Yeah, meet? we had a theater. Had it, was a theater? In a, it was in an old church. Oh, great. Actually, the church was still being used as a church. Oh, so that's they, great. They had, a room, they had a room and downstairs. You know, there's a lot of, lot of Chicago buildings that are old churches. And but isn't like that, that what that whole thing is? It's creativity, doing something, using, you know, using something that's already there. Yeah, you know what I call it? I call <laughs> it guerrilla theater. You know, yeah. G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A, -L -L not, yeah. the, not the animal. Is that still <laughs> vital? The Onyx oh, yeah. Theater? Oh, no, Onyx is gone. Oh, that, it's gone. That, that lasted about five years, and then it kind of folded because a lot of our members were going off in their own careers. Lydia Diamond, who was a, a founding member with us, her, she just had a play on Broadway, so she wrote Stick Fly, which uh, oh, was yes, on Broadway. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, was, yeah. she was with us as an actor, and she, she was a writer, too, but she was acting still. So then. would you say that was 20 years ago? We started it in 94, but in 98 we folded. You yeah. were like really nurturing actors. Actors, at the time. directors, writers, yeah. All and that. now you're an artist in residence at the Court Theater? Court Theater in Hyde Park in Chicago, if anybody out there knows Chicago. We do. What, yeah. do, you, what, is, what do you do as an artist in well, residence? Well, uh, I, I direct uh, uh, maybe one or two plays on the season. I'm also involved in nurturing uh, talent and bringing diversity to the theater. Oh. So we, you know, so we'll do some non-traditional casting of plays. Uh, next season we're doing a, a Moliere, uh, two Moliere plays in rep. We're doing Tartuffe and The Misanthrope with a non-traditional cast. Both easy plays. I mean, yeah. both interesting. Exactly. Like you can mix the... Exactly. But when you were with the Onyx Theater, was it all a black theater? No, actually, no, we did, we did, really all kinds of 
plays, uh, but we did them in a non-traditional sense. I Still non-traditional, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Pasadena is getting Jitney. You directed Jitney. Right. You directed it first at the South Coast Rep. Mm-hmm, yeah. Isn't um, this the same cast? Is it's this the, what's it's the same cast, it's the same production. It's just uh, a few little adjustments because the stage is a little different. I was going to ask yeah, about that. What, it's what a else? little different. That one is a little bigger, so we had to kind of compress it a little bit, which actually adds to the real reality of Jitney stations in Pittsburgh because they're very small, about the size of you know a, this a room? studio. Yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering. We don't know the word Jitney. I guess it's a taxi. Yeah, Jit Jitney stations is funny because in a lot of communities, not only Pittsburgh, but where I'm from in Buffalo, Chicago, Detroit, there's areas in the city where the licensed taxi cab drivers won't go. <laughs> you right. know? Oh, so they don't go. They won't go because oh, they're, they're usually, see. you know, maybe high crime or, you know, African-American or Latino or gang, uh, I got you it. know, gang related. I see. So they don't go there. So usually it's done by the people in the neighborhood, which uh, usually they call that uh, a jitney. That, but it's okay with the licensed taxis then it's not like a renegade it's it's really it's really not it it is technically not legal right but it's not a renegade they're <laughs> but, not like yeah it's a service that they're providing yeah it's a service in fact in the play that it's called car service you know it's it's that's what they are it's, um, it's a needed function and it's written by august wilson right and tell us about august wilson well august wilson to <laughs> me is the most profound and prolific he was he's passed away now a uh, playwright uh, in, in, in my lifetime, um, and uh, he, he, he wrote a cycle, he calls, calls it the, the Pittsburgh cycle of uh, African American culture, 10 plays, 10 decades to, to study the, 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 the culture of African American. And he was people. writing the last one as he passed, right. wasn't he? Radio golf, right? That's so good. Yeah. And, and it took, so it was how many years? Well, he, you know, he started writing in the late 70s, He's mid writing 70s. 10, 10 years, yeah, more than 20. You know, actually, when he first wrote Jitney, it wasn't, he wasn't writing it as, okay, it's going to be one of the cycle. He was, it was his first play. He wrote it, it was a one act, and he put it away. And then he, he got to Ma Rainey and uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which was his, his first big success. And after that, he kind of decided, well, I got something here. I think, you know, I'll pull, let me pull Jitney out. And, um, oh, you know, that's what yeah, happened? Yeah, it came later, much later. It was, to me, mm -hmm. anthropological, folklore. I mean, I Definitely. think he captures something that is going to be lost. No doubt about it. What, for me, it's, it's very spiritual kind of awakening for a lot of people, for the actors, for the director. Oh, for the actors, too? Oh, yeah, for the actors, for the audience, for everybody. You know, I, I uh, the first time I, I worked on when I met him back in the early '80s. Oh, you did. And um, I was working with a playwright named Oyamo, who's another uh, profound uh, playwright uh, who's out uh, teaches at University of Michigan, where I went to school. But he um, he was writing then. You know, he had this 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 desire and this fire to be a, be a playwright. He was a poet, and. Um, so that's why you can hear the poetry and the lyricism and the music in his language, you know. But, uh, you know, he just started writing, and it's just so, it's just so weird that, you know, he finishes the 10th one and passes away. I know. I it mean, was shocking, wasn't it? Yeah, it and was. And it was his desire. He must have just stayed alive to finish that. You know, I, 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 I think so. I think he fought his will to live was strong. Yeah. When you talked about the music or the way he's he the poetry of what he does do certain actors uh specialize in <clears throat> wilson plays yeah in fact uh my <laughs> experience do. with august go you know goes pretty far back but when i worked i worked on jitney in the original uh not the very first production of it but when it got going around and it came to the goodman and I got the opportunity to understudy three roles, three actors that I uh, that mm -hmm. I idolized: Stephen Henderson, Anthony Chisholm, and I was able to to kind of work under Marion McClinton, who was the director at the time. And August was there, and I was just oh, an understudy. Was. Yeah, he was there. He was rewriting act. He was writing it. Oh, actually. that was great. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I was able to kind of be around that 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 version of it. And I, I must say that that has helped me with this this production. But did he cast? Did he have people that he saw yeah, as he, he different had a, roles? What we call, I call them the Wilsonites. 
<laughs> That's what I'm yeah, wondering. Paul yeah. Butler, Anthony Chisholm, Stephen Henderson, Russell Hornsby was uh, was in that early uh, uh, rendition. He's on Grimm now, the TV show. Um, and so there was a there was a, a stock group of guys that did a lot of the productions at that time. And you cast the mm -hmm. South Coast rep. Uh, edition of right. Jitney, mm -hmm. and you use Charlie Robinson. The Charlie Robinson has mm -hmm. he done work? Oh yeah, he's August done. Wilson's? He's done a lot of August, and uh, it, it's funny. You will find I did find a few of the actors in the play who hadn't done August. And oh it is yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Did you cast them anyway? Yeah. <laughs> but but do they? What do they learn? Is it? It's well because you know my style of, of directing was a very open kind of kind of style. I was able to, you know, get across what I was trying to get across to them, and they're all fine actors. They just hadn't had the opportunity to do this language and this music and this rhythm. And, you know, in, in the beginning, we started talking about how in Shakespeare, you have to develop a rhythm and a pattern, mm -hmm. and it's the same in August's plays. There's a rhythm that you can hear the music. August used to sit in the back of the theater and and not watch. I mean, he was a smoker back then. He smoked <laughs> a lot, but he he would just listen to the to the music and to the the cadence yeah. of the words and, because and he wrote them to have a certain exactly. So so I find that in when I try to do uh, August plays, I try to find that rhythm and try to hear him. Hear his ah, voice, his ah. his voice in, in the. Language. If somebody's like that and somebody has never heard it before, and you're giving them a chance, do you actually? Would you get up and say the words? Would you get up and say, "This is how"? Well, you know, my he style, my style of directing is not like that. I, <laughs> I, I, I like an actor to find it uh. themselves, and when they do, when they do that. It means more to them. I mean, you can tell an actor what to do, <laughs> right. but they don't really know why they're doing it. They're imitating what you did. And they do it very well because yeah, they're, they're can, actors, right? They can do it very well, but it's not coming from the heart and soul of the um, character. Mm. So when they find it themselves, it's, it's a lot of times when an actor says, you know, well, well, what, what's going on here? And I say, well, you tell me. You know, what, what do you discover? What do you find in that role, in that character, in that moment versus me telling you? And that makes it more real and more uh, more positive for them. Let's say, let's talk about your directing. Say from South Coast or the Goodman or uh, wherever Jitney was, wherever you've directed it mm -hmm. before, taking it to the Pasadena Playhouse. Right. Do you try to make it different? Well, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, this, this is the fourth time I've been associated with the play. I, I was an actor the first time. But um, each time is a new, fresh uh, approach a new. That's what uh, I wonder. Yeah, new feeling. Now this one because it just closed in, in South at South Coast and is moving here. There won't be a lot of change. It'd be mostly adjustments from this for the stage. But the cast they they, they had a, a nice rhythm uh, going when I left. I left just after <laughs> it opened. So I'm, I'm hoping it's the same play. <laughs> But, you but like, if you took it somewhere else, would you keep it the same way? Well, you know, or would you? I mean, how do you change a play? Well, let me let me say this: When yeah. I go back to Chicago, I'm, I'm at Court Theater. I'm directing Jitney as the first show. Oh, you of the are season. okay. Yeah. Then how do you? So it'll be it? all Chicago people. For one thing, it'll be all Chicago people and people that I know who know me a long time, and it will be different actors. Yeah, so that's oh, different, yeah. right? That's different. Different set, different actors, different um, lights. You that's know, what I wondered. So, so the different. set's different too. The set would be different. It's a different designer, you know, uh, uh, different sound, different things. Although the sound is so great in this production, I'm I'm hoping to keep a lot of it. <laughs> but for the most part, because you got new actors who are have new rhythms and new new physicalities that they want to bring to it. The fight choreography might be adjusted yeah. because of the set. The set oh. might be a little different. So that's you how know. you change yeah, it. Yeah, it has to change, and that's the thing about August. Is writing is that every time you go into it, it's like the first time. That's how I feel. You know, this is a, this is the nineteenth, the nineteenth uh, uh, August Wilson production uh, that I've worked on. I've, wow! I've, I've, as an actor so and director, <laughs> well, I've done a lot of them, and I feel like that experience of being around people, like I said before, Anthony Chisholm, Stephen Henderson, Paul Butler in those early days, they really influenced you know how I approach it, and uh, I just feel that that has grown and grown with you know me growing and maturing as an actor and I still I do still act you know uh, not so much uh, so something happened like one night in Pasadena 
Could you go on stage? Well, if you're here, because you're well, living in Chicago, right? I have to go on with the book. But, uh, <laughs> go with the book. You know, but it's funny, though, because when you're around it a lot, you do, you do know the lines to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, of course, you'd need a little rehearsal right. for timing and things like that. But, you know, in rehearsal sometimes, uh, I could tell when an actor was, you know, saying the wrong thing, even if I wasn't looking at the script, right. because it's like music. It's oh, like I a see. song. You heard when it. you hear a wrong note right. and you're listening to Barbara Streisand or something, right. you know that's not the right note. Right. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's that's fabulous. Thing. And just before we leave, uh, we talked about Ma Rainey. We talked about Radio Golf, mm -hmm. uh, Jitney. What is the well, two trains running, yeah. Gem of the Ocean, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, Seven Guitars, uh, Fences. Fences, I saw. Popular. I love that. Charlie was in that one <laughs> right. at South Coast Rep. Yeah. And uh, and I, I've done I've done all of them except for King Headley, which we which didn't mention. Which is the ninth one and Rhett, the tenth and, one. And Seven Guitars, I didn't do. I did the. Pittsburgh premiere of Radio Golf. That was a great experience because yeah. August's family was able to come oh, and see it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's Thank been you. so great. I'm glad I could get down here to do this. I'm glad, too. <laughs> uh, don't go away. Lori O'Brien will be back on the show. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with writer, actress, Lori O'Brien, who was born and raised in Colorado, earned a bachelor in psychology and a master's in theater from the University of Colorado in Boulder. And Lori, you were destined for show business because you wrote a play when you were how old? <laughs> oh, you know, that's true. I had forgotten about that. I was uh, in third grade. And you're like nine years old? Yeah, or, oh. yeah. And what and, happened? Well, I, I put it on with my three <laughs> friends and in the, uh, for the, the school. The school. And uh, we won. It was like a talent contest. And oh. we won that. And then in fourth grade, and here is the, the, the most fun part. In fourth grade, I wrote another play in, in, for my class there. And um, I cast my best friend, who was this beautiful, beautiful girl. I cast her as the witch. Perfect. <laughs> I was the princess. See, you were, you were destined for show business, <laughs> weren't you? And you've been writing ever since. You know, I have. As a matter of fact, in fifth grade then, oh. I, my, teachers, my teacher was like so, didn't know what to do with me because I was like finished with all my work really like. Oh. So he had me write whenever I was finished. And, and then on Friday afternoons, I would read what I had written. And I, I wrote a story that year about four, like quadruplet or something, Cherry, Berry, Mary, and something, I don't know. And I would read little chapters on Fridays. I think maybe that's why you went to the mental <laughs> hospital. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. <laughs> because you found yourself directing workshops in a mental institution or hospital. In many institutions, yes. In Denver. In Denver. And when did that come about? After you got your master's? Yes. yes. And what did you do? Um, well, I went to places all over Denver. Um, Mercy Hospital, Children's Hospital, the Fort Logan, Denver General, CU, and I ran theater workshops. How could you do that? How did you decide to do that? Well, you know, that's what my master's degree was about. Ah. I w had been working at National Jewish Hospital to put myself through school. Mm -hmm. And I worked um, with children who w were chronic mm -hmm. asthmatics and had to live there. And I discovered that a lot of their emotional problems were um, lessened if I read to them and I did theater with them and stuff. So I went back to get my master's degree uh, trying to figure out a way to work with people through theater. So when you were writing, were you uh, researching in the hospitals for your master's? Were you doing that along with it? I stopped working at, the, at National Jewish when I went for my master's degree. I worked through the psychology department and I worked through the children's department and stuff like that, you know, to yeah. form my own program. And um, then did research out in schools and stuff. And when I graduated, I had this program it, under my arm. Yes. And then I went out and searched for somebody who wanted to do this. Oh, well, that was great. And then they opened the doors to you. And, and did you then um, use that research? For the play that you've just written, oh, I Am Chrissy? Absolutely. <coughs> and it wasn't exactly the research. More it's the um, experience that I had in, in there. Um. Chrissy is sort of a, a compilation of people that I worked with over the years. Because when I walked away from the work, finally, 
was kind of chronically depressed at that point, I um, made a promise to myself and to them that I would tell their stories. So that, was, that followed you. How long ago? And how <laughs> long did it follow you? But that was 30 years ago. It was. So it's followed ago. you all the time. Mm -hmm. You came to Los Angeles. You went on the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been in films. You've done a lot of TV work. Uh, uh, film Bottle Shock, I love. Oh, good. And the cartoon characters you've done. And yes, you right. read books, too. But I you do. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I, uh, I have been fortunate to have a really varied um, career with characters that have a lot of depth and emotion to them. Which is Honestly. what you studied. Right, exactly. And here's the thing is, is that I actually am grateful. I actually feel like I owe, I owe a debt to these people who I worked with, who gave me insight uh, into human emotion. And it w I'm able to now portray. You know, I sort of feel like I am a, a window to other people's pain sometimes. Mm. And that um, I am grateful to them for giving me the How do the you insight. write about it? How do you write about it? Well, it's hard, and you know, and that's part of part of the reason that it's taken me thirty years because I. Let, let's go through that process because you started, you decided you were going to write about it. You were going to be a window for them, uh, and you worked at the Catsellas Theater Company or with them. They have a, a program called Incubator. Right. See, I had these stories that I'd been collecting over the years. Didn't know what to do with them. Um, should I make them into a novel? Should I? send them out as individual stories and um, try to get one published and then you know more and more yeah, and more like that. Yeah. What, should, what should I do? And about that time I get this uh, email that my friend uh, Tony Abedamarco was putting together um, a workshop on forming your own solo show. And so I said, oh, maybe that's what this is. So I joined up. Oh, and that, and that, and he did Beautified there. And he's, yes, exactly. He's a fantastic, he's directing you. He is. Okay, so the process is you signed up, and then what happens? So then I would, you know, every other week I would bring in a little piece of what I was trying to do, and I was struggling along with it and, you know, overwriting, saying everything, and doing all of this. <laughs> Which we always want to get. And, you know, it's a good thing. It's, it's actually what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to overwrite so that you can get it all there and then start taking it off and taking it away and, take, you know, honing and <laughs> yes. honing. And, and Don't stuff. do that to no. my work. <laughs> no. no, but you know what? Tony will tell you that I'm actually really brave about that. I, I actually know that one of my problems is, is that I overwrite. And so I really slash away and I go, oh, okay, good. I can get rid of that. Oh, good. I can. And you know, it's great because you've got the computers. And so he's fabulous, Tony. Tony's at, at the best. Like clearing out because his play, Beautified, was fantastic. And yeah. he directed it and yeah. wrote it. Yeah, you know, he didn't direct it. Oh, Jenny he didn't Sullivan. Know. Jenny Sullivan. Oh, directed that's right. It. Jenny's yeah. Jenny and she did. is fabulous. I worked with Jenny. I, I was Virginia in the Clean House at, in, in Santa Barbara. She's a wonderful director. Oh, that yes, everyone yeah. speaks very highly of her. Yeah. He did write it. He, and, he, but he's directing you. But he's directing me. Okay, so he's so, been in from the inception right. of it. So so what happened is is that I took two of those two six week workshops and at the end of that, if you take two, you get to do what they call the greenhouse where you get to take 10 minutes of your, of your thing and, and, and uh, present it publicly. And so I did 10 minutes of it. And Gary Grossman, the, the producer, saw it and came up to me afterwards. And he says, I want to produce your show. That's great. So I only had 10 minutes of it. And it, and it did get produced. It's opening this Sunday. Right, at the Skylight uh -huh, on this, Vermont. On Vermont. You had this connection to w the women's movement also. And did that influence this writing? Compl yes, very much. My mother plays a, a, a big focus in this, too. Oh, tell because, us about that. Well, because, because um, I play myself in this, this show at 27. And I play Chrissy, who is in her late 30s, late 30s. And my mother, who is in her 50s at that point. And my mother makes um, um, a bold move at that time that I speak of a, a, a lot in the thing. So there's like, because the 70s, that's right there at the, in the middle of the, the women's movement. Yes. You know, I mean, I came of age just as the women's movement was at its mm. uh, really coming in. So did you get to partake? Did you, oh, you were confused? Well, I think it was confusing to all of us. 
or did you get to, or did you embrace it? Well, I think we all embraced it, got benefits from it, but it, well, I think it was a confusing time of, you know, you're you're told at a, you know, you're raised a certain way, and then set, there's the women's movement, and right. there's all these mixed messages from the media and from the society and from your parents and and your fourth and grade different teacher. kinds of women talking to you and different. Yes, exactly. Everybody had different ideals. And then there was the sexual revolution, which is not to be confused, <laughs> confused. with the women's movement, yeah. but oftentimes was. So do you include all of that in this yes. your show? Yes. One, one of the things you said is sanity is found in the craziest people. In the craziest of places. Of places. Oh, yes. not of people. Yeah. But that's also true. You know, that would actually be a good, good line, too, because it is true. Because <laughs> one of the things that I found through my work with the insane people was my own sanity. You found yourself. I found myself. But that's myself, why sometimes pe people say you have to do that. Um, you talk about all the different ages involved, three different women. What do you think the audience will be taking away? How will they look at this? Well, I hope that they get out of it a number of things, including the feeling that, that we're all in this together and that the lines are really blurry and close, you know, that we're all on the edge on one way or the other, and to have more empathy and understanding with crazy people, <laughs> homeless people. <laughs> right. But also, it's a very hopeful play, and there's a lot of humor in it, in spite of the fact that I'm, that I'm dealing with um, uh, homelessness and insanity, madness. Um, there's a lot of hope in it, and I hope that people come away feeling encouraged. Will they un identify with the different ages of the women? I think so, and, and, and not, I, think, I think so. I think so. I hope so. And before we leave, tell me what your role in Bottle Shock was, because that was so great. My role was to play Christopher Pine's mother. Yes, that was nice. And I was rich, and, um, and what was really cool about it was is that the actual real woman was there on the set with me. Oh, yes, because... <laughs> and she actually was in the scene with me. She was sitting at... Because uh, it took place in a country club. And uh, she was at one of the tables. She was an extra at one of the tables. But it was really great. Too. So that was great. And the other thing, I know you were whispering one of your cartoon characters. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, yes. This is actually my claim to fame. Okay. I um, was... Baby Piggy on the Muppet Babies. <laughs> Baby for Piggy, ten look years. at you. Yes, for and they used years. to always call me. They used to always call me the pig. They'd say, "Oh, come on, let let the pig come over here and sit with us." And it was great. <laughs> and what was your voice? Say it. Oh, Kermy, could you give me just one little kissy, kissy? Hmm? Oh. Kermit, get over here! <laughs> Hi! <-ya! laughs> That's so great. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> And good luck on your play. Thank Thanks you. for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com, uh, 777 South Figueroa, 44th Floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.